Every spring, the Humanities Council offers a group of young DC leaders the opportunity to learn more about their communities while immersing themselves in the humanities. In the past, students have created products such as oral histories, documentary films, and performing arts projects as a result of their Soul of the City experiences. Soul of the City 2010 is no different. Journey with us as our group of 40 young high schoolers learn about the Vietnamese, Ethiopian, and Salvadorian communities and develop performances, writing, and other materials based on those interactions. If I say stop, it means go. If I say go, it means stop. If I say jump, it means clap. If I say clap, it means jump. Let's try this. Clap. Max created really fun icebreaker activities. On the first day, there was silence. Clap. By the time they started playing the games and interacting with each other, they were having fun working as a team and listening to each other. Jump! Before I started this program, I was pretty shy, I guess. Um, the acting exercises like kind of loosened me up, just to, like break out of my shell. And I think that's the same thing with this program, is just to make you feel comfortable with whoever you're around. One of the exercises we did the day that I really, that I really was excited about when we had to do a liquid sculpture, where one of the people in our teams had to start off with emotion, and then basically we kind of react to what is going on to kind of, um, to basically kind of fill in the picture so that it could flow. Okay, freeze. Beautiful. This helped build improvisational techniques and also the relationships between the team members. Watch the order. A lot of kids uh, tend to be shy, but this group proved to be very much willing to jump into the fray. So actually, it was a lot of fun to see them just throw themselves at it, you know, and to become characters and to write these wonderful pieces that they wrote. So I'm going to really give you a writing exercise. Just take 15 minutes and begin the process of writing from somebody else's perspective. 
We did writing exercises where we wrote poems or stories or we drew pictures about something related to immigrants. Beginning to take into account all the things that you're hearing, the stuff that is coming in, the information about immigrants, because that's is our, our, our umbrella theme. A lot of things are said about immigrants that are not very nice. But I always say to people, when you talk about illegal aliens, when you talk about people from other parts of the country, you are talking about somebody's child, somebody's mother, somebody's brother, somebody's sister. It's not just some Mexican or some Haitian or some Vietnamese person that you could just discard. So the condition is, is that you have to write from the heart of this person. So become somebody else. If you're a woman, I, I advise you to maybe become, uh, become a man. If you're a man, become a woman. You know, you can come get the means. You could be old, young. You could be a child in the womb of the mother. You could be somebody that died crossing the border. Some of the new things that I learned was um, I didn't consider myself a poet or a writer, but like the activities that we did kind of pulled you know, the inner writer, the inner poet, out of a lot of people who were down like their skills. I like some of the writing that we did because it gave us a chance to show how, how we expand our imagination and just having a great time with it. So who's gonna go first? All right, right here. Mama always told me to love kills. Well, Mama, I'm addicted to loving this change. See, you don't understand growing up in a world where they promised you change gonna come. Well, I'm waiting, waiting to cross this invisible line brick wall so that you, so that I am no longer invisible to you. They chisel, they chisel alien across my forehead, and honestly, I'd rather live up there. Because down here, I can't hide in the empty spaces beyond the stars. Down here, you feel hateful, I feel sorry for you slurs, but you don't understand that every night I cry sorry for you. The same eyes that you can't seem to understand. Understand that no matter how many have a nice day bags I get out, you will never be happy until I'm gone. But you don't understand that, leave, that me leaving will not break this lie that you tell us every night. This synthetic foundation I built my life on, Mama always told me that love kills. Well, Mama, I'm addicted to loving this change, and I know that these barriers will never fall because the same ignorant eyes that amputate me every day are the same ones I look to that told me and made me believe that change will come. So every day I wake up and piece by piece, sadly, I die loving this change. Whoa. Those men with the big old arms as big as me. They told mama and I to get up and get your things, we're here. But where was here? We've been sitting in this box for what seems like months. Once we got out, it was like we walked into a sauna. I mean, it was burning. California, they called it. And, the man, and man was it hot. The man that brought us here said that we were on our own now and gave us a little money for food. Mama then took my hand and we got into a taxi. Everything in this place was different. They even drove on the wrong side. But it was so beautiful. Tall trees, with big huge leaves at the top. And we drove past the ocean and big waves, people walking around with swimsuits, which is the best clothing for this place. And then I turned to mom and asked her, what is this place? And she said, honey, it's home. I, the main of this is called Nirvana. And it's basically like um, talking about the experience of like like a Chinese twenty year old who moved from who moved from a rural area of China, growing up with his family, who are basically like who be, um who are very strong in like a Buddhist religion, and he's enjoying that. He has a freedom that he moved to New York City from them. So basically, like it's titled Nirvana, and it's a poem. Now I found it, a place of true perfection without the family's fear of godly intersections. Pressure from the father to reach nirvana. But I wonder was this actually achieved by Guantanamo? Their idea of perfection was my road to perplexion. It perplexed me, vexed me, and any, and any other word meaning that it stressed me. I luxuriate in the bold imperfections of secular American titles than the false perfection of shaven disciples. 
I thought they're unthinkables, then committed their sins. Did it twice, did it thrice, now I'm at it again. I don't care if that Asian Buddha isn't my hero, because I'm too busy enjoying American MTV and Coke Zero. <laughs> Complete peace is other chaos in my spirit. Thank whoever for the siren sounds when I want to hear it. The loud shoutings of Italianos with their Dominicanas. But no silence from all, but no silence from all monks. Now this is Nirvana. My soul lies in many cities. I spread myself throughout the earth. I leave my skin where I was born. I place my tongues where I lay. Giving my soul to many places does not make me shallow. In fact, it gives me depth. I stretch my soul across the earth like in jared bread across a plate, and I cover the earth. I am the fullness thereof. Youth from the Vietnamese Community Service Center came to share stories and watch our performances. What does it mean to be American? Uh, to have freedom. To have freedom. Uh -huh. And to, you can do whatever you want. To have <laughs> Competitive? Competitive? Yeah. Being an American is competitive? Is being competitive? Yes. Cool. <laughs> Uh -huh. And striving to become somebody better. Striving to become something better? Okay, so that's what being American means for you. Yes. Okay, cool. We're going to do a, a fluid sculpture. Did you guys catch that? Mm -hmm. So, striving and competitive. Being American it means striving to be something better and being a competitive person. And um, your name, I'm sorry? Joseph. Joseph. That, Joseph feels like he's an American and that's what it means for him. Okay? So taking that position, we're going to do a fluid sculpture so you guys can stand up. Okay, and let's watch. I can always do better. I can always do something. Come on, you can work! Come on! Come on, you can do it! Come on! Come on! Come on! something that will always remain with me because of the Soul of City. Um, I think it will be meeting um, the speaker, Khan. I was amazed at how his uh, experience was moving to America and his family history. I was born in Mekaw, Vietnam. Um, I was born and grew up there. Basically, my family, my mother's side, has three generations of rice worker. We are a rice worker. We plow the fields and we plant the rice and we have probably uh, several acres of rice field in Vietnam. All throughout my life I'm characterized by ferocious animal who is attack little child or warmongering emperor you know trying to conquer desolate lands and that, that is so, sort of like the Asian connotations of Khan. You know, and people keep asking me, Khan, what does that mean? I was like, I don't know, Khan. That's, it was like, why don't you know? So, where are you from? Maryland Heights in St. Louis, Missouri? And then they go, no, where are you really from? And it's like, my mom's wounds? And so, and like, everybody, because of my sort of stature and my heights and the way I look, is like, you're Asian. But where are you really from? Vietnam? 
So my family and I came to United States in 1989 here and we settled in St. Louis, Missouri. So basically my whole entire life I grew up absorbing the American culture, particularly the suburban uh, American culture. If you had to pick one country, America or Vietnam, which would you pick? I have to live in the United States, I'm sorry. Um, this is the culture I was raised up. Uh, but the, the pro that's a good question. If I have to pick, that's a question I wake up with every day. Because I can't, sometimes I just can't feel like I'm Vietnamese. Uh, even though I, I can speak the language fluently, I can do everything from cooking, writing, to anything you name it. But the problem is that I can never feel like I, I belong in that. But at the same time, coming back to the United States, oh, because, you know, my height and dark hair. It's, yeah, exactly. So, I, I know, I know, people have been telling me that, but, you know, it's rough. I can never feel like I'm both, where something, there's a sense of root, rootedness, where my root, I got uprooted. And, you know, there's something about origin and how you're rooted and you're grounded, where you're born and where you, you know, like, where your race and that sense of root, I feel like I don't have that yet. And that's what I really explore every day. The Ethiopian Community Services and Development Council also spent a few hours with us sharing their stories and delicious food. We are a, an acting project, a drama project, and we want to ask you to, to tell us your stories so that we can practice our skills at acting. A person would give a story and then we would um, reenact that to give like a visual of the story. What happened? What was the, what happened? When did she first see snow? Yeah, I'm going to give it to my school. Yeah, it's her first time in her lifetime to see snow here. Mm -hmm. She's here for uh, eight months. Yeah. Is it the one that happened last month? Yeah? Yeah. Okay. And um, what happened? She, she, she saw it and what did she feel when she saw it? But I'm not just selling. And I chased the Malik image of Marek Zeno, but I'm not. You tell a year, I'll almost get alone in the sun. She's very happy about it. So she was, she was very happy about it yeah. and she uh, went out with her kids to play. Yeah. Okay, so let's stand up, please. So seeing snow for the very first time, being really surprised and happy about it and going outside to play, okay? And let's watch. Oh, this is so beautiful. Oh, this is so beautiful. This is white stuff. Oh, this is so beautiful. <laughs> stuff. Oh, this is so this beautiful. Is snow. Oh, this is so beautiful. Oh, this is so beautiful. We're building a snowman. Oh, this is so beautiful. Oh, this is so beautiful. Yeah, 
It was really memorable for me because it kind of, they kind of had me in their culture. So like I was kind of part of that for that moment and I felt special. We were paid a visit by Dr. Shumat Seashine, History Department Chair at Newport University in Virginia. He shared a rich understanding of the long history of Ethiopia. In ancient times, the word Ethiopia was used to describe people with black face. So it means someone with a black face. Uh, and much of the world uh, used to call people sa Africans south of the Sahara as Ethiopians. So Ethiopia is really a generic term that was used to describe all people. Uh, and, but starting from around 2,000 years or so, uh, we have the uh, rise of a major power uh, in what is today uh, Northeast Africa uh, that started calling itself uh, Ethiopia. Uh, it started from Aksum, a small city-state in northern Ethiopia, and expanded to include a good portion of the highlanders of present-day Ethiopia and some of the adjacent territories in the Horn of Africa. So for the last 200 years, Ethiopia is also used to describe that state that emerged uh, in, 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 in that area. Could you talk a little bit about <clears throat> the history of the Ethiopian community here in Washington? And what, part of my question is, why did you come, why do you think that so many Ethiopians came to Washington to see specific? Uh, I think it, it probably has to, uh, as I said, the Ethiopian emigration, the, the bulk of the Ethiopian emigration started in 1974. That was the year that the Emperor Haile Selassie was overthrown. That was the year of the revolution. Uh, until that time, Ethiopians living in North America usually used to reside here in Washington, D.C. Most of them students, largely because the embassy was here in Washington, D.C. So if there were Ethiopians living in the United States, they would have been living here in Washington, D.C., most of them students. And, 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 and today, of course, uh, Northern Virginia has the largest concentration of Ethiopians outside of Ethiopia itself. It has become a major factor. In the old days, it was strictly students. Later on, it was mostly political refugees. Many of them resettled from the Sudan and from Kenya. Uh, and now, of course, through the DV family reunion and so on. And we have still uh, more and more people coming. So I think that's the genesis of, of, of Ethiopians uh, here in Washington, D.C. and Northern Virginia. Imru Zelika, retired ambassador of Ethiopia, was generous in sharing his story of which we interpreted through playback theater. I was born in Addis Ababa much longer. I'm 86 years old now, so you can imagine I'm a teenager. Uh, and uh, I grew up uh, in Addis Ababa. I, was, uh, I went to school there at the time. I went to a French school because the teaching was in French. And uh, but I also learned some English because I had an uncle who was, uh, who was uh, sp uh, English speaking. And uh, uh, I was born in a well-to-do family at the time. We had our own house and our stable. You know, uh, at the time, I'm talking Ethiopia, you can imagine it like the United, uh, well, uh, 17th century, 18th century uh, Europe or something like this. We were, uh, you know, quite uh, an ancient, we were isolated country. So our way of life was very, I, I wouldn't call it primitive, but certainly it was. We didn't have cars, we were riding mules or we walked uh, and so forth. So we went to school uh, walking maybe five, six miles uh, right, at the time and so forth. And 
then we had an Italian invasion of uh, Ethiopia, and uh, everything uh, was uh, discombobulated. The Italian occupation was very strong. A lot of people died, and me, my family, uh, my father had died already, so my family, my mother, and my two young sisters, the, the younger one, she was only two years old, we were taken with thousands of people in a concentration camp uh, wow. built by the Italians in South Somalia. Uh, we were arrested first uh, during the night, and then we stayed three days in prison, and then we, they put us on a camp, mm -hmm. and then from there we were transported by car Mm -hmm. from East Addis Ababa. I don't know if you realize the distance by truck, no, not by car. The mm -hmm. trucks were full of people. There was no seating, nothing. We were piled up in there. And uh, we drove about uh, 2,000 miles got down, all the way down. It took us about uh, almost a month and a half to get to the threshing camp. A month and a half in a, a month truck? month and a half. And it was where people were, uh, you know, getting sick and some of them were dropped on the way because there was no way you could uh, bury them even. Wow. So I'm telling you this just to show you the experience uh, I went through in my youth. Mm -hmm. uh, what happened was in, uh, when, I, when the revolution came, uh, a lot of people got arrested again. Many of them, many of my friends and colleagues were killed. So I escaped from Ethiopia through Kenya. Mm -hmm. I drove down and then walked uh, the rest of the way to, wow. uh, across the border. And then I came, I came to Nairobi. And uh, the sad thing is I lost my notebook where I had all the phones. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know what to do. I didn't know whom to call. Okay. When we arrived at the border, we had just an ordinary car. The two tires on both sides collapsed when we were at the border like uh, here mm -hmm. and the two two tires on the right side they blew up okay <laughs> so there was a, you know the guards were there to say what are you doing and so forth so uh, we said you know uh, we we cannot repair the, the car so we said you see the Moyade it's a hill mm -hmm. and there is a river this side is the Ethiopian mm -hmm. uh, Moyade and the other side is the Kenya mm -hmm. So you have to cross this and the river. Uh, so, so we said, you know, we better go on the other side and look for somebody to repair the tires. Mm. So they, since they thought that we wouldn't leave the car there. Uh -huh. So we left the car there and we walked across. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we went into this camp and asked for a refugee status. Oh, OK. Yeah. And so you were a refugee running away from yep. war. Yeah. And you had no, you'd lost your notebook with all the phone numbers. Yes. In it. Mm. Can we re can we reenact that? Mm -hmm. Can we can we do an enactment? Yeah, of that? sure. So you guys are fleeing the war. You come to the border. The car breaks down, and you decide to walk the rest of the way to ask for a political asylum. And let's watch. You guys okay? Yeah. The tires they've blown. We can't go any further. Let's get out. I don't know. We're, the river's upcoming. Let's go ask these guards what's going on. Everyone all right? Yeah. yeah. What are you here for? Our car broke down and we need to get to the other side. Okay. We, we're trying to plead political asylum because it's not safe where we come no, from. No, no, no. You don't say that to the guys. We need to go to the other side. <laughs> <laughs> so you say I want to have my cars repaired and I look for somebody, you know, to repair the tire. We need someone to repair our car on the other side of yeah. the Okay. Ah, so, and then you just walked straight through. We went straight through. So you, just by chance, you ran yeah, into somebody who yeah. was able to get you a ticket to yeah, America? Yes, and wow. then uh, the embassy, they gave me the visa. Uh, I went, to, I came here. It was winter. I didn't have any clothes. I was just uh, some khaki shirt and so forth. And there was another black American ambassador which was in Sweden, which I knew in Sweden. Mm -hmm. So I called him up, he, he came and picked me up and brought me some clothes. <laughs> uh, it's good to have friends. It's good to have friends. <laughs> the Ethiopian guy, he actually sat at my table for um, the time we shared together. And he had like a wealth of knowledge to offer. So I just appreciated listening to him. Listening to him. And um, 
his his life it was like it was crazy and all the struggles he went through. We kind of connected on the uh, on the topic of music because like he told me that throughout like all his experiences in life that music was always like a central idea that everybody can you know agree on, and I. I I saw like the similarities between everybody, like how how our differences can be a way, you know, to attract us in the end. So him overcoming all that and then having, you know, the presence of mind to come back and share with the youth was, you know, a good thing. One of my favorite parts of the program. When the Ethiopians came to eat with us, I was actually fed by one of them. And um, I really I really appreciated that because I felt kind of accepted in their little community. And I don't know, it just made me feel good. And like, the lady said you want to feed, and like, she like fed me. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And how did that feel? That felt good. It was, it was different. Like, I was just like, that's what I asked her. Like, so you guys feed each other? Uh -huh. And she's like, yeah. Like, Mauricio Lopez, Salvadorian immigrant, artist, DC language access lead education organizer, shared his DC experience as an immigrant as well as his artwork. I came here when, uh, 21 years ago. Uh, DC was totally different than what you see now. I don't know. I mean, who was born in DC? Like, picturing pretty much. Who's from Norway? Columbia High. So uh, pretty much that's where we came to. The Salvadorian community came to La Manplesa, and that's where we started growing and you know exploring. I mean, so that's all this over year, America. That's just here. Yeah, it's all uh, where the target uh, is now. Gala Theater, um, Bell, the new Bell that you see now. Uh, the um, Latin American Youth Center, Columbia Road, all that used to be mostly Salvadorian. We still got some, a few families left. Everybody kind of move out because it's getting so expensive to live in this city. Old Columbia Road was ghetto, you know. That was the way it used to be, you know. There was like empty buildings. Uh, people was shooting crack there. People was getting overdose. Uh, a lot of crime. 
you know, around the city. And a lot of nonprofit organizations came out and tried to help us. And, and we were kids that were getting in, in a lot of trouble. Um, Bell does, it doesn't used to look the way it is now. It used to be an old building in the back. Um, Lincoln used to be where Bell is now. We didn't have all that you guys have today. Uh, there was no metro. Uh, mm -hmm. Behind Gala Theater kind of was like a lot of, um, what do you call it? Um, trash. Trash. trash yeah. Really? And empty lab. Empty lab wow. and, uh, so um, you saw what we've been doing with these images. Yeah. I want to try to get them to make an image of, of, so this is the 90s in Columbia Heights. This is early 90s. Early yes. 90s. So can you guys stand up? And from what you're hearing now, can you give me like three words to describe Columbia Heights in the early 90s? Columbia Heights in the early 90s? Yeah. Poor. Poor. Uh, drug addiction. Drug addiction. And gang violence. And gang violence. You guys can try to hold all those ideas to give us a fluid sculpture. Okay? Let's watch. Mauricio also gave us a personal tour through Mount Pleasant, the community he grew up in during the 1990s. My apartment used to be that three windows in the middle between these white door and the other uh, over there. Uh, so I used to live there. Historically, 63 was like the border. This is the dividing line. You wouldn't see a white person on that side. Not really. I mean, honestly. So it's amazing now to see the amount of white folks that live on that side because that was all black and Latino. I mean, when, when, when Latinos came into the city, it was all black. So we're the first immigrants that came into black neighborhoods. Like I said to you, the other day, poor people live with poor people. And those are the places that we could afford. And that's why you had a lot of uh, racial uh, antagonism uh, out of ignorance. We didn't know who we were. We didn't understand anything. We didn't know anything about each other. So this is the dividing line. We've been talking about gentrification, right? right. Well, Mount Pleasant, as all these buildings that you see, these are all apartment buildings that still house low-income people. The 42 bus, it starts here. And there's always the joke about the 42 being the free Spanish class, because everybody that boards it, for the most part, speaks Spanish. But the, this is the thing, there's always this, this uh, contradiction. A lot of uh, the Anglos that live here take the 42 to go to the office jobs in the morning with their briefcases and their ties. And then they come back after five and that's when the Latinos get on the bus to go clean the offices downtown. So there's always been that contradiction. We ate a delicious lunch at Haiti's Salvadorian restaurant, an establishment founded by Haiti Venegas. Olivia Cataval, folklorist, curator at the Smithsonian Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage, shared her understanding of the immigrant experience. And you are in a historic place. Anybody tell you who you are? Hey, this is this is Heidi's. Heidi's. Yeah, big hand for Heidi. You probably have heard a lot of stories about all the different people that make this neighborhood. This is a very interesting neighborhood because it's very diverse. You know, that's a word everybody uses, diverse, 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 diverse. This area really tells you what it is. We are people that come from different countries in Latin America, in, from the Caribbean, and have sort of come together here and decided we're sort of a big family of sorts. We fight with each other, but we also 
work. We have our stores here. We have our schools here. And most important, we have pioneers like Heidi. Heidi, I won't give you dates because I'm bad about that, but she came here in the 80s. Okay, and all stories. Kika's probably told you a lot of stories. You know, in the 80s, we had lots of people coming from where? El Salvador. Why are they coming from El Salvador? War. War. Documentary filmmaker Ellie Walton showed her film Igual Que Tu about immigrant laborers in D.C. She also brought along one of the film's subjects and cameraman, Ben Hamid. Vienen guatemaltecos, hondureños, mexicanos. La mayoría viene a buscar trabajo y solo caen como seis trabajos, diez trabajos al día, cien personas que hay aquí en la esquina. Yo vengo aquí todos los días a buscar trabajo. A veces agarro trabajo, a veces no agarro nada. ¿Cuántos creen que todos los que salieron ahí en, en la documental son inmigrantes? Uh, ¿Cómo es? Okay, ¿cómo? ¿Cuántos de ellos piensan que qué? Que en el video ¿Ah? todos son documentos. Okay, how many of you think that all the people that you saw in the, fi in the film are undocumented people, illegal aliens? How many of you think... Or, or, okay. How many of you think that all of the folks are illegal? Most of them? Okay, I think it's the majority. Anybody else? Okay. What are the rest of the questions? que si hay personas que son estadounidenses que tienen papeles de cara. Okay, do you think that there are some Americans in the film that are fake? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Right. ¿Cuál es la realidad? Bueno, la realidad que. Además, ¿cuál es la realidad? Que la mayoría piensan que todos los que van a buscar trabajo en una esquina todos son extranjeros, indocumentados, pero no es así. También hay ciudadanos americanos que van a buscar trabajo ahí. Saying that there's this misconception that all the people that go, that are day laborers, are illegal, are, you know, here illegal. He says, but there are a lot of U.S. citizens. He says that show up daily to look for work. Por qué Home Depot? Porque Home Depot, ustedes saben que es una tienda grande donde venden pintura y bastantes contratistas van a traer material allá. He says it's a big store and a lot of contractors. They have, they, have, they have jobs, go buy their supplies there, paint, wood, all kinds of supplies. So there's a, there's a chance that those contractors that are buying materials will have a gig, will have a job. That's why. And just to add in again, like what Kike was saying, like that chance, that like hope. Like even though they go and oftentimes they don't find a job, it's like if they don't have a job, then it's, just, it's that like feeling of like I may get something. It like keeps them, keeps them going every day. If not, they're just gonna wait, wait at home, you know? So it's like that. Also, there's a community on the corner. I mean, there's people who hang out there every day, so there's a lot of people, and like, they, they, you know, they, they kind of can talk and hang out. Sometimes it, some people go there, not to for dust, but to, you know, just to like get that feeling of being with something, being part of, of a community, like a neighborhood, yeah. Um, I didn't understand why the jobs at Home Depot, like they flip flop, like one day they could be working, and the next day they couldn't, like, like why did that happen? Like, que por qué dice solo trabaja un día o dos días, dice, o sea, ¿por qué? Porque, bueno, porque no tenemos un trabajo seguro y en las compañías no, no nos contratan a veces por no tener unos, unos papeles. Ok, dice que porque a lot of companies won't hire you because you don't have documents. Pero yeah. also the reality is that a lot of people they just need something done, like, you know, here, like, okay, let's take down this wall. Oh, okay. You know, or do my garden, mm -hmm. right? Or clean my basement. It, it takes one or two days, and then, okay, here's your pay, and that's it. You know, it's not like, oh, I need somebody to work for me, you know, continuously.
different from what I expected. The yards were small, the trash on the ground. The buildings are ragged. It's so different from what I've seen in the Hollywood movies and American magazines. <laughs> I met a friend. Her name is Jasmine. And she seems nice. Mama thinks it's good that I made a new friend. But Aunt Anna says, be careful who your friends are. The U.S. is different from home. Tonight, Jasmine wants to show me around. I hope it will be fun. Yes, people look a lot poorer than I thought. I didn't mean to take May there. Like, I just wanted to show her a good time. I didn't, I didn't mean for this to happen. Man, once again, I've gotten people mixed up in my crazy lifestyle. Supposedly, people were supposed to be my friends. Man, it's hard living this American life. If only you had one May more, we wouldn't have this problem. I set this in motion, and now, now my family is hurting. I wish I didn't bring May here. Have to make her have so much responsibility, as if she was an adult. It's hard living this American life. life. I thought you guys did a really good job at, at getting emotion like out of the South. Like I was, I was surprised at how real it was. I thought it was a great job. The timing between Legend and April, like when she was confronting her, like you wouldn't really call it banter, but the timing was really good. The sound effects were good, and, and maybe you can think about putting more sound in there. If it works, um, amp it up. You know, maybe you can even have some some beats or something like that find a useful way for it. I think the ending is a lot stronger than the beginning. Um, like, at the, the big conflict between the daughter and the mother, and then the daughter being so frustrated with the mother that, that she's kind of like the mother's link to the world because she speaks English. That doesn't come out to the very end, right? Yeah. Maybe you need to establish that in some way, let it be known earlier on. Hello, my name is Aiko, and I'm a 10-year-old Japanese girl. I'm here on a plane with my mother and my brother, coming here to the United States. Right now, things are so terrible for us. We have no money, no food, and especially no house to live in. But you know what? I have hope. I have hope that when we come to the United States to reunite with our father, that things will be better. America is the land of the free. Unfortunately, me and my family just arrived in the wonderful United States. The very moment we departed the airplane, they pulled me to the side. They pulled me, my mother, and my sister to the side because of our short stature and slanted eyes. 19th of January, 1945. My dear husband, it's been six years since you've been gone and I miss you so dearly. The kids miss you a lot as well. We recently received a warning to flee Hiroshima because the United States government has threatened to take some serious action if the Japanese government does not surrender. I received a letter from my wife yesterday. She said her and the kids might be coming to the United States to save this time. I hope she doesn't expect the man that she fell in love with because I met that once vibrant-eyed young businessman from Tokyo. This internment camp has absolutely sucked the life out of me. I like to boss these Japanese people around because I don't feel like they deserve my respect. Why should I be nice to them if they bomb my country? Although I have a lot of hatred toward the Japanese, I still feel sympathy that they can't be connected to their family. In the back of my head, I hope that in the future they'll be able to reunite with their family. But at the end of the day, I start to do my job. Froze. That part was like really tough. Like it was emotional because you could see the pain on his face and the pain on their faces. I thought it was interesting that you chose to do the perspective of someone who like wasn't in the family and how he was doing his job. Let me say, I mean, I really like the the walking and then stopping and then like like you know he said you know it's just kind of like there's this kind of symbolism there of the detachment and then coming together and the detachment and coming together. Coming to America. Green card, green card, look hard. So many things to take in. Can't understand the languages like TTFN. I stand alone, 
while one man sits on his throne. What can I do? I board the plane with my duffel bag in hand, hope in my heart and a dream in my head, bearing the long flight to the land of the red, white, and blue, ready to start my life over and make anew. The plane starts shaking, it's turbulence, they say, as my heart starts pounding, filling with fear and dismay. I'm escaping from war, from death and poverty, longing to fly, to live, and be free. I step off the plane as fresh air fills my nose. This is the place where freedom rings and bravery blows. I'm here and I made it all in one piece. Now let's see what America has in store for me. Going to one place to another, how it seems to change, buildings, styles, tastes, and language, how to speak into another tongue, lost in my mind, trying to ask for help. One people are looking at me. I scream, help me, help me, but nobody understands me. From this chaos, I transform. Not conform, but transform. Keeping my identity, my history, and my dignity, I transform. And the unity that roots the community roots me too. Unity within chaos, chaos within unity. I soon find out that chaos breeds beauty. I mean, it's very powerful. I mean, the words are so sincere. I wouldn't want to do so much to, to it or with it, you know, because I think it's the simplicity and this kind of like the, the, the bareness of it is, is what makes it so strong. You know, I, I had this crazy idea, and this is just a suggestion of creating this. this you can just put your back, turn like a circle with your back, with your shoulders like this. Okay. And, and and having and having it rotate, you know, with each with each you know with each speaker. Soul of the City 2010 has proved to be a success. We all learned so much about the many different people that inhabit our beloved city, Washington D.C., and feel a stronger connection with our city by embracing our differences and those universal similarities. Joining Soldier City, it was it was new. It opened my eyes to a lot of things in DC, even though I was born and raised here. Actually seeing people for their cultures and their backgrounds, so it was like everyone was the same really. I didn't really have a deep insight as to who those people were. The Soul of the City was an amazing program. Um, I love the fact that it incorporated uh, a lot of uh, students from the D.C. area all around the high schools in the D.C. area. And it was interesting just learning how to work with different personalities and to also be more expressive in, in terms of like uh, theater and performing. Not only did we discover many aspects of the immigrant communities, Many of us learned more about ourselves through the process. Some of us discovered that we could stand before a group of our peers to share an intimate story. A few of us discovered a curiosity for acting, writing, and leadership. I'm usually a quiet person, and this is my first time doing any kind of acting experience. So I am still kind of struggling with it, but I've gotten a lot better with stepping outside of Olivia and going into another character. The thing that I've learned the most during this experience was acting and improving through, um, through story. Through Soul of the City 2010, we have broadened our perspectives and appreciated where we live. We hope you do as well. Thank you for watching.